It really does not seem like eight years to me. <coughs> Hope it doesn't to you. But uh, time goes by very rapidly, doesn't it? And who knows what God has in store in years ahead. But I thank God that in the Word of God, one of the things that is said to us as believers is that if we are living biblically, we should be laying aside the things that are past and doing what? Moving forward, pressing on. And I sincerely hope we shall continue doing that as we minister and labor together for the grace of God. I'd like to share some thoughts with you this morning that fit into the little series we're running on the believer in the world. Last week we talked about the believer and the world inside of himself. Today we would like to share some thoughts about the believer and the world around him. And the final two messages will deal with the believer and the world which is above him, the eternal world, and the world of Satan and his cohorts, which we will call the underworld. First of all, what is the world? <laughs> Here, have you ever heard someone called a worldly Christian? People say, I'm dead to the world. Now, sometimes they mean they're asleep. And sometimes they mean they recognize that they have no part in the world. A believer can say that. You ever walked in on someone that uh, you've made noise? We had a fellow one time in the dormitory at Grace Bible College that slept so soundly. We folded his mattress up over him. We carried him into the men's room and laid him down under the wash basins, turned all the water faucets on, all of the showers on, flushed all of the other items, turned the lights on, and it never budged him for a moment. As we walked out the door, someone said, that guy is really dead to the world. And he was. He was sound asleep, and nothing woke him up. But when Paul uses that expression, he says, the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world in Galatians chapter 6, by the cross. What is he talking about? What is that world? It isn't just a terrestrial law. I'm not dead to the physical globe. Are you? Don't tell me you are and come back and tell me about the beauty of Mount Rainier or the majesty of Niagara Falls or the the power of the ocean or the beauty of the rocks and the canyons out west or wherever else you've been. I don't think God wants us not to enjoy the creation of his hand. I think that's why he leaves us here. When the word of God talks about the world, if it's talking about the physical earth, it may use the word earth, sometimes the word world, but there's a Greek word, gay which means physical globe, the earth itself, that mass of matter. But the word that is used for world is the word cosmos. And it has more of the idea of order. It has more of the idea of administration and organization, a system of things. In the book of Isaiah, as the prophet Isaiah closes his prophecy, he says God is going to create a new heavens and a new earth. And the new is going to be so magnificent that the old will not even come into mind. I think it refers to more than just the physical beauty. Though I'm sure that God's creative capabilities have not been exhausted by the creation on which we live. But I think it refers more to the order and the system of things. On the talk program, I have a man that calls me the does not like America. He does not like the United States. He does not like what we stand for. He does not like what we do. And I said to him one day, why don't you stop all your belly aching and get on a boat and go to whatever place in the world you think is better? Well, he doesn't want to do that. He wants to reform us to his way of thinking. And as a discussion went on, I said to him, you know, there was a man running around our country at one time who didn't like anything about the United States. He protested everything. He not only protested it, he put action to his words. He became a revolutionary. He tried to upset the order. And finally, he made it so unbearable for himself that he had to leave. He went to Cuba. In a very short time, he wore out his welcome in Cuba. He went to other lands. 
And finally, after being gone for a period of years, he has suddenly decided that I would rather have God and Christianity and what America stands for and be in jail in the United States of America than be free in these places that I thought were so great. And he came back and his name is Elder Cleaver. And this fellow hung up on me because he didn't like that. You see, there's a system of things. And the believer is involved in that system of things one way or another. So we should look at what it is. Physically, we are alive in the world. We are under its jurisdiction. Look at Romans, the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 3. This is a passage that we talk about on the 4th of July or a Memorial Day type of thing. We fall under a government. We live under a government. It is not godly. Our society today is not godly. There have been found along the California coast 17 bodies of children who have been killed in the making of kitty porno movies. They have no clues at this point of time as to who did it. Our society is going that direction. That's the type of place we're in. Our government is not godly. And yet look what it says in Romans 13. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authority. Why? This man who wrote this, this Saul of Tarsus, this Apostle Paul, by the time he penned this, this man did not live under a beautiful system where everything was roses and peaches and cream and lovely and where there was a chicken or two in every pot and everybody was totally employed and there was no uh, problem between the races and there was no problem between the government and its people. He was raised in, as a captive nationality under the Roman system. If you've never read a history book about the Roman government and the Roman things that were going on at that time, get out a history book and read it and see what kind of a government it was. It was not beneficent and kindly. It was mean and nasty. It was not moral. It was immoral. In fact, Time magazine within the last year made an analogy that they used to laugh at us as preachers when we made. Time magazine said, we are repeating the mistakes of the Roman Empire that were made during this time as far as morality and government and law and the tenor of society are concerned. Yet he says, be in subjection to those authorities. A little further, you know, just in case we don't get the idea. He says, there is no authority except God allows it from God. And those which exist are established by God. That is, they're fixed in their place. Therefore, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they have who have opposed will receive the judgment. You commit treason, expect to pay the price for it. I did not always agree with positions that Dr. Martin Luther King would take. But there was one thing about that man that I respected above all of the others who were running around in that period of time critici criticizing our country. Dr. King was willing to stand for his convictions even if it meant going to jail. And he went. Now, you may not like what he did or said, and I may not, but I have to respect that that man lived by his convictions and he was ready to pay the price for his convictions. Paul said, rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Now, I'm just putting this in because I think we must recognize as believers that when Paul says we are dead to the world, he is not saying we can come and go and do as we please and not obey the laws of the land and some people have the idea that because we're not of the world, we don't have to give any kind of recognition to the system at all in any form. And I disagree strongly with that. The Lord Jesus Christ was approached by the disciples one day, or by some, not uh, the disciples, by some of the Jewish leaders. And they said to him, Lord, do we really have to pay taxes to Caesar? You remember that story? And the Lord said, well, take out your coin. And the man took it out. He said, uh, Whose picture is on it? And the fellow said, why? Caesar's picture. And the Lord responded, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. Now, understand that the taxes of the Roman Empire, the people didn't vote their leaders into office. They were put in office by the Roman government. They assessed the taxes at their own rate. And the tax assessors who came out of those people, and those are the ones called publicans in the King James, 
The publicans were people who lived in that area of the same nationality as these oppressed people, and they were counted as traitors by everybody else. They got no salary from the Roman government. The only way that they got any money was to increase the tax levy. And the more they increased it, if Caesar said, I want two bushels of wheat out of every acre, they turned around and said the taxes are four bushels of wheat out of every acre, two for Caesar, two for the tax collector. That's how they earned their money. That's how they earned their living. You can imagine the reaction. Suppose Dick Christofferson was the tax collector under those circumstances here in Bethesda. And he came to Frank Myers and he said, Frank, your taxes are $675 for Uncle Sam and $675 for Uncle Dick. How, what kind of a relationship would there be between these two men? And how long would they be on speaking terms? And how close of a fellowship would they have? Not very much. And yet the Lord said to these people, pay taxes. In spite of the fact that it was oppressive. In spite of the fact it was an ungodly government. The Lord said, pay the taxes. Now some of us have to understand that. We better have to understand something else. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. This is a marvelous text on the believer in the world. But it starts out where he isn't a believer. Ephesians 2. At one point in our lives, before we came to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior, this description fit us to a T. And you were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the authority of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even like the rest. Our manner of life, our style of being, our nature of being, belonged to a system. A system not just of the Roman government, but a system of philosophy and religion that related to God. The Roman government was an amazing government. For the Roman government was the first of the world empires, or relatively close to the first, that did not impose a form of religion upon its conquered people. The Roman government allowed the Jew to be a Jew. He had to pay taxes to Rome. He had an army dwelling in Jerusalem. He had a garrison there. He had a garrison in all the other major cities. But he could worship at the temple and the sacrifices could be offered and the high priest could minister and there was nothing to block it. So that there was a, a relative freedom. When Paul talks about being dead to the world, he is talking about that philosophical religious bent of the world that carries a man away from God, not just the governmental factors that keep order in society. The philosophies of the time were very, very dangerous to the believer. So Paul wrote to the Colossians and he said to them, Fellas, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men. A philosophy is a worldview. A worldview that takes a man's eyes and takes them away from the sovereignty and the power and the might and the goodness and the love of God and fixes them on man or man's doings, or man's things, or some alternative power and direction. Let me give you our choice philosophy right now. Our choice philosophy today is humanism, basically summed up, very much of an oversimplification, but basically summed up, humanism states that all of the answers to all of man's problem reside within man himself, that he can solve everything, that he is the be-all and the end-all and the goal and the best and the answer to everything. Now that's a real oversimplification, but it is, I think, essentially correct. There may be others who adopt a different philosophy. There are a number of people in the United States of America today who have adopted the view that God cannot solve things, Satan can, and they worship and serve Satan, and it is no small number. Right now, the headquarters of the Church of Satan is in San Francisco. But they have purchased land 
in the city of Minneapolis to relocate their headquarters. I don't know whether it's going to arrive or not, but that's the plan. You see, Paul said to the Ephesian, like it or not, you were stuck someplace. You were caught in a web, a philosophy, a, a bent. He said the same thing to the Romans in the sixth chapter of Romans. He said, before you came to know Jesus Christ, you were the slave of sin. Now, here we are, stuck in a bondage as human beings. How do we break that bond? Why? We're born into a new sovereignty. When God's word shines into our heart and the spirit of God brings it to fruition, there is a new birth. A spiritual nature is begotten, which according to Ephesians 4.24 is created in the righteousness and the holiness of the truth. Jesus Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Fantastic. How do I get it? Simple. You'll never get it by going to church. You will never get it by being good or obeying the golden rule or doing the best you can or doing more good than bad or being religious. It's available in only one way. If you have a medicine bottle in your shelf somewhere, it may say on it, this medicine is available only upon the presentation of a prescription. You can't get it without the prescription. I don't care how unreasonable it sounds. You can go to the court of law and say, it's unreasonable for me to only get my medicine by prescription. But the law will uphold that. God said, I have a prescription. If you want to break the bondage of sin, if you want to be free from the ensnarement of that world system, if you want life rather than death, if you want liberty rather than bondage, if you want joy rather than sorrow, if you want hope rather than hopelessness, the answer is my son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And anybody that wants to come to my Father can try any church he wants. Is that what he said? No. No man cometh unto the Father. How? But... By me. Now, we went to Los Angeles. And I've had several people say, what road did you take into Los Angeles? Did you take Highway 15? And I said, yes, after it made a junction with Highway 20. Well, why did you take 20? Why didn't you take 40? Why didn't you take 66? Why didn't you take... You see, there are a lot of roads going into Los Angeles, all kinds of alternatives. But there are not a lot of roads going into God's heaven and God's sovereignty and God's family. Just one. And God the Son on the cross of Calvary paid with his blood the penalty price for my sin, took my guilt, my sin, my penalty on himself at the cross of Calvary and offers to me a completed payment and eternal life as a free, sovereign, wonderful, loving, gracious gift. It's that uncomplicated. You know what makes it hard? I used to get a magazine called Family Handyman. It had plans for building a dresser. It had plans for building a coffee table. It had plans for building a house. It's a do-it-yourselfers magazine. The United States of America is a do-it-yourselfers country. We like to do it ourselves. And that's what we try with eternity. It doesn't work. That's what makes it hard. It's hard somehow for us to say, God, I need your I cannot save myself. That's hard. And my friend, if you came in this morning and you're not trusting the blood of Jesus Christ paid on the cross of Calvary as the one payment price for your sin, you are without eternal life. And the only way to get it is to finally before God say, God, I am the sinner for whom Christ died. I cannot save myself in Jesus Christ is my only hope and my life. And commit yourself to him. Now that makes a change. You see, we're still in the world. We're still subject to the laws of the United States of America. We still pay our taxes, hopefully, otherwise we'll have to visit you in some other place. We pay our taxes. We visit our countryside and look at it. But now there's a change. 
Galatians 6, 14. Beautiful verse. If you've never memorized this one, by all means do. It's a tremendous prayer. It should be the prayer of the lives of most of us, all of us as believers. Let it never be said that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. In what should we glory? Should we glory in man's ability to solve man's problems? He has not done very well, beloved. We are not doing very well with our problems. It wasn't many years ago when we thought we had things like venereal disease with. And today we have an epidemic and a strain that we cannot touch with any of our miracle drugs. It is not curable yet. Do you remember the joy when Jonas Salk discovered the serum that conquered polio? Do you know what was one of the fastest growing diseases in the United States of America this year, 1977? Polio. And all oh, the joy when we discovered things like pacemakers. And yet the largest single factor taking the human life in our land is heart disease heart disease right now. Every time we think we have conquered something, we come up with a nothing. Now Paul says to these Galatians, Galatians, listen. You want some place to rejoice in, some place to exalt in, some place to glory in, some place that isn't going to lose the battle and isn't going to lose the war. You want some place to say, here is victory and here is joy and here's the real thing. Then glory in Jesus Christ. And God is God. And that, the world system doesn't like. That bumps up against that philosophy found in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 23. He says, why is though living in the world, are you subject to those rudiments and those rules? Why don't you recognize the liberating power that is in Jesus Christ? And who is on the throne? And we're not left helpless in that struggle. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, there's no trouble taking you but such as is common to man, but that God will with that test. Provide a way to escape that you may be able to bear up under it. All of us feel like our problems are unique. Nobody else has the same problem. That's not what 1 Corinthians said. All of us feel it sometimes like we're alone. That's not what 1 Corinthians said. All of us feel like a situation is impossible. That's not what 1 Corinthians said. 1 Corinthians says, no problem is too big but that God will, with the problem, give the strength, the ability to bear up under it. He doesn't always take it away. If you think he does, you come tonight as we continue our study in the book of Job. He doesn't always take it away. We're in the world, dead to the world, and if there's anything the world does not like, it is something it cannot understand. It's one of the strangest things about the world system. It doesn't like what it cannot understand. Do you know why it opposes the idea of God creating the heavens and the earth? It cannot understand creation. It is not a process that it can understand. Why does it make fun of the concept of a new birth? Because it cannot understand it. Why does it make fun of the word of God? I have listeners that call in on that talk program regularly that try to poke it apart and make fun of it. Why? It can't understand it. Don't be amazed that the world can't understand it. First Corinthians says that. It says it's spiritually discerned and you need the residency of the Holy Spirit within before anything other than redemption can make sense. You may collect the facts like who David's great-great-grandmother was, but as far as the world is concerned, that's history. What difference does it make? Why bother reading a book that talks about somebody's great-granny who lived a long time ago? This is one of the philosophies of the time. The book is out of date. We're in a post-Christian era, and that's from a long time ago, and it doesn't make any sense today, so why bother? And the believer says, that's the word of God. I'm supposed to eat it and love it and live it and let it live through me. Now, those two positions are as far apart as they can get. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says, I have weaknesses, and I don't even know how to pray about them, but God in my life in the world, puts the Holy Spirit within my heart and within my life. 
so that when those times come and I can't even pray because I don't know how to pray, that he makes intercession for me. And that he works all things together for good. The world doesn't have that. God's strength, Paul said, is made perfect in my weakness. Go oh, think of it when Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.10 and he says, Timothy, Demas has departed. Demas turned aside because he loved the world. He fell in love with the philosophies and the things. And sometimes they're together. We have lived in a society that is very materialistic. And I think some of us as Christians may still be convinced of some of that. That having things automatically makes us happy. Now we are faced with an energy crisis and some of those things are going to have to be set on the shelf. Do you think we're going to be unhappy? We will adjust. We will change our lifestyle. And we may turn around and say, you know, it really isn't so bad after all. It really isn't so bad after all. Maybe God in heaven is going to keep the oil companies from finding enough oil to keep us all running for a while so that we can take a little time to slow down. Because everybody I meet says, life is going by too fast. We're in too much of a hurry. Everything goes so fast. And you say to them, slow down. I can't. Why? The guy behind me is pushing. We stood in those lines in Disneyland. And every once in a while, a line would move a, a jump, uh, like that, you know? And some fellow would be standing there talking with his back to the line in front of him, and the space would get even bigger and bigger, and some fellow in the back would say, Move, you dopey guy! Get going! You know, can't go anywhere because there's still 400 people in front of him. But you've got to hurry up to cover those three feet, or four feet, or ten feet. Maybe God is just going to slow us down. But we've bought the idea, and it's a philosophy of the world, that speed and doing a million things makes us happy, or buying a load of things makes us happy. And we as Christians have never weighed that that is not a biblical point of view, that we have been caught by the philosophy of the world without even realizing what's happened to us. That's what Paul means when he says, I'm crucified to the world. He wanted to be alert when those things came along that they didn't sidetrack him from what there is in Jesus Christ and turn him to a different direction. And we're supposed to live above the world as believers. Very quickly, let me give you some. Look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. What a testimony. You see, we're here. Paul doesn't tell us to, to not recognize that we're here. He says, we're here, and we're in the world, but we're not of it. Let's not live like it. One of the amazing things to me is that Christians are saying, how close can I get to the world system without being touched by it? And the world is saying, why, they have much more than we have. A fellow one time came to me with a list of things that he thought Christians shouldn't do, and he said, do you do this? And I said, no, and that. And we went through the whole thing, and we got all done. He said, boy, I wish I could be like that. I said, you can. All you need is Jesus Christ in your heart and a desire to live for him. He said, but then I'd have to give up all those things. I said, you just said you didn't want them. He can't understand it. He just can't. Philippians 2.15, one of my favorite verses. Among whom we shine as lights in the world. The word light is a luminary, a reflector, a mirror. We're not supposed to shine us as lights in the world. We're supposed to shine as reflectors of Christ in the world. That's what they should see when they see it. How would you like some morning to get up Walk into the bathroom to shave or comb your hair or brush your teeth. Look in the mirror and see somebody else's face. Wouldn't that shock you? I think of that fellow on TV that opens his medicine cabinet and the other guy says, Hi, guy, you know. What a shock. Somebody is there. You know, somebody doesn't belong there. As long as the world sees anything reflected in us other than Jesus Christ and what he can do in a life, they're getting a distorted image and they're seeing another face in the mirror. And that's what it means to be crucified to the world, to be reflecting Jesus Christ, to not be caught by the system and philosophy of things that would take our eyes off of the greatness and the power and the might and the sovereignty and the love of our God. And too easily, we get distracted. 
If there's anybody that should be nonconformist, it should be Christians. Listen, you want to hear the nonconformist chief two verses? Here they are. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship, your reasonable service. And be not, what? Conformed to the world, but be transformed. Figured. That's the word. Transfigured. How? By the renewing of your mind. So that you can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That, beloved, is nonconformity. It isn't nonconformity to go out and live like a hippie. That may be nonconformity with society, but it is conformity to the system. The only nonconformity to the system is to reflect Jesus Christ to the world. And anything less than that is not nonconformity. It is not even nonconformity to be moral and nice and a good neighbor and friendly and all of that. Because there is a church called the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. And if you want to have a nice neighbor, you have a Mormon for your neighbor. They are fine, moral, clean-living people. They make good neighbors but they are conformist to the system. All you have to do is interject, interject Jesus Christ into that and you'll find out where nonconformity to the system begins. It begins and ends and revolves around the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's what makes nonconformity to the system. Not morality. You could take all of the world's morality apart from Jesus Christ and it would do it no good because it is still hopelessly lost in sin. We are to be dead to the world. It does not understand. Sure, don't be amazed by creation. Don't honor human institutions. He did say, he did say, you are dead to the philosophy and the heartbeat and the organizer and the ruler of the system. You live in it, but you are not of it. Be therefore a non conformist to the system. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said we are made spectacles to the world. Some people think that means glasses and you're able to see through them. No. No, what it really means is God put us on a great stage. It's called the earth. And he left his people there so that they could play a role and people could see what Jesus Christ could do in their life. And that the change in that life is worthwhile. The believer in the world, we're here. Let's recognize the reality of being here. Let's accept the things that are involved in that reality. But let's not get caught by its philosophy and its heartbeat until that becomes our heartbeat as believers instead of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we could write with Paul and say, God forbid, that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto thee. That's what we need in the church of Jesus Christ today. Our recognition that we are here, that we have a job to do, that the job is not unpleasant, that it is not left for us to do it unaided, and that in the eternal long run, God's things are far better than the world. Aren't they? Aren't they? Timidly, some are going like this. You know what happens if you shake too vigorously? Somebody's going to look at you and say, well, then let's live like that. And that's ultimately the challenge of a message like this, isn't it?